Hi, I'm Sabin Yaakov. This presentation is entitled Battery Balancing by Switched Capacitor Theoretical Consideration. Now I'm considering here a string of batteries which are to be balanced and this is done here by flying capacitor which are connected by switches. All these upper switches are turned on together and then the lower switches are also turned on together. So the capacitor are actually moving or connected to a upper battery and then to a lower battery. And here we can see it uh, a little bit more in detail. Say we have two batteries, we have two switches per battery, we have the capacitor, and then when the upper switch is on, the upper switches are on here and here, then this capacitor is connected to this battery, and then when the lower switches are on, this and this, then the battery is connected to the lower battery. So the capacitor is connected to one battery, then to the other one, and if one battery has a higher voltage than the other one, then the capacitor will be charged to a higher voltage, and then it will deliver the charge or energy to the battery with the lower voltage. Eventually, this uh, process, when it goes on, will propagate throughout the string, and eventually all the batteries will be balanced. Now, what are design issues of a system like that? First of all, is the major question, what should be RDSR? And then the capacitance, the frequency of switching, and also there is the question of drive, because we have transistors which are sitting here at a high voltage, and we have to drive them on and off, and so we need some sort of a drive. This is an issue which I'm not considering in this presentation. Hopefully, it will be in the next one. So first of all, what's the theoretical basis of this operation? I'm showing here a capacitor which is connected to one battery and then to another battery. This is very similar to what we have here, uh, but it's not exactly the same. That is here we have a floating capacitor which goes from here and then it goes here, while here I'm showing a capacitor which is sort of grounded and it's connected to one battery and then to the other battery. From the operational point of view, it's uh, exactly the same. It makes life a little bit easier when um, analyzing the circuit. So let's uh, leave it as it is here. So we have one switch and then another switch. In reality, in our cases, these are two switches with two resistors. And then there are two switches with two resistors which are connected uh, here and uh, then moving the capacitor from one battery to another. It has been shown in many papers, some of which I've written, that in a system like this, you can replace the whole switching part with an equivalent analog resistor, R sub E, which is making the circuit behave exactly like this one, although uh, it's a ever model, you don't see the switching, you don't see the time domain behavior, but the average behavior is exactly the same. In this system, we have a resistor, it's an analog or continuous or average resistor, which of course is a function of these resistors and the capacitor in a non-trivial way. And this is what I'm going to discuss. So first of all, we have to realize that in a system like that, there are three possible modes of operation in terms of the current that you would expect in the real system here. And it has to do with the question, what is the duration of the on time as compared to the time constant? If the duration is long, much longer than the time constant, then you'd expect to see something of this nature. And in this case, the process sort of terminates. And then you start again. On the other hand, if the time interval here is very short, the capacitor is barely charged, so the voltage is about constant, and therefore there is a constant difference between the voltage of the one side of the input and the capacitor, and therefore the current will be constant. And in this case, it will depend on the actual resistance, because we have a constant voltage here, we have a constant voltage here, and obviously the current is the delta B over R. In this case, let me just jump ahead, it can be shown, and I'll show it in a while, that 
it really doesn't matter what's the value of the resistor as long as this is the behavior. That is, if I'm going to have a smaller resistor, the instantaneous current at the beginning will be higher, but it'll end much faster because the time constant is shorter. If the resistor is larger, the current will be lower, but it'll take more time. And it turns out, which I'll show in a minute, that the RMS value is the same. So therefore, it really doesn't matter what's the value of the resistor. Here, definitely, uh, you have to take into account the value of the resistor. And then we have an in-between situation that there is a partial discharge, but doesn't end, okay? So it's an in-between uh, case between the, we call it complete charge, no charge, and this is a partial charge. So let's have a look first of all at the complete charge. So we have a difference here, and I'm talking about the real system, not the average one. This is just a representation. So in the real system, I mean in the switch case, we have a current which of course goes down exponentially uh, like this, delta V over R, and this is the first, uh, this is the current at uh, T equal to zero, and then it goes down exponentially. Now the power is I square, I square integral, I square times R, the integral of which, and then divided by the time. And once we do that, I get this expression, okay? That the power is delta V. Now this term is in fact a delta V square F times C because we have the R being cancelled out, the two, and then T is one over F. So we end up with this expression. So what we see here, that the power dissipated in this situation is independent of the resistor, comes out. So we can then say that we can represent this power dissipation by a resistor, continuous operation, average operation, and equating these two power, I find that this resistor is one over two FC. This is the total resistance that you need for the total operation. I've taken it two into account. And therefore, we see that the equivalent resistor is dependent only on the capacitor and the switching frequency. What about the case in which the time interval is very short? So the current is about constant. So the current is about constant, and the value of which is delta V, the difference between the capacitor voltage and the uh, input voltage, say, divided by R. Now this instantaneous current here, during this time interval, relates to the average current coming out of the source and eventually going into the load by a factor of two. Because from the load, you have only during this time interval the current and there is no current. So the average current is actually half of this value. So this is twice the average current. And then we do the same thing. We say, okay, for the same delta B, what will be the power dissipated by a linear resistor, constant resistor, and we find this relationship, that the equivalent resistor, in this case, in this uh, no chart as we call it, is four times R, R being the resistance of the switch. And I'm assuming here that two switches have the same resistor. Now summarizing these, we find the following. If I plot then the R is in a log-log scale, let's start with the high frequency, that is when the time interval is very short, the resistance is 4R. Now, if however, I pass this point and go to a lower frequency, then I find that the resistance is 1 over 2FC, independent of R, and since it's 1 over F, then in a log-log scale, it's a straight line. Okay, so in this region, once you reach this region, the value of the resistance of the switch does not matter. 
obviously if you make it very large you'll move to this region but as long as you are staying in this region resistance of the switch doesn't matter on the other hand on this region the capacitance doesn't matter because you, it's only the resistor now obviously the value of the capacitor and the resistor will determine where is this break point and equating this to this here equating 1 over 2fc 4 r I find that this break point is about 1 over 8rc okay now if the resistor say is larger losses will be higher at a high frequency and the switching a point will be moved to a lower frequency so what's the implication uh, of this behavior the implication is that if you want the lowest resistance for the balancing operation you have to be somewhere here moving to a higher frequency does not help just increasing the losses that uh, are due to the um, charge that it, you have to deliver to the gates of the MOSFET. So you'd like to work close to here. Now obviously here you may not wish to work because this is just wasting the resistance that you have because uh, even if you have a small resistance you still are dependent on the capacitor. So this would be like a good operating region to have the lowest resistance using the RDSON in an optimal way. Now let's have a look now at the issue of the battery case. Now typical battery curve voltage versus state of charge, this is milliamp or amp hours, is a curve like that. For lithium ion it sort of started about 4 volt and it ends at about 3 volt. So we have a span of 1 volt. And here it's about a straight line, it's a constant slope. So we can say that in this region the, ba the battery is actually behaving like a capacitor and we can find the value of the equivalent capacitance by delta Q over delta V, this is the equivalent, and for a given amp hour which is charge in amp hour units and then you have to multiply it by 60 times 60 to get second uh, this will be the value of this equivalent capacitance now obviously it's going to be a very large number in farads and this is the the beauty of uh, batteries that they have a large capacity I mean that's that's all about it so in this case we have actually two batteries one representing they said the one with the higher voltage, one with the lower voltage, and now I'm showing it as two capacitors with this equivalent resistance. And as this process starts going on, we have one battery higher voltage, one battery lower voltage, and then the current at the beginning will be some, the difference here, delta V divided by this R sub E, and then of course going down to exponentially depending on the total capacitance which is having two capacitor here in series is of course this uh, uh, term here and the current will go down meanwhile the batteries which will approach the same voltage okay so this is the process that will go on and this is assuming two batteries in reality in the case of the let me go back uh, to the string here in this case of course or even here uh, suppose this battery has a higher voltage then charge is being transferred to this one and then from here to here so this battery will not see this B sub 2 rising too fast because charge is being taken from here and therefore the process is a little bit different from what I'm showing here in a sort of a simplistic way uh, just between two batteries, here it is, uh, just between two batteries and, and a resistor. In, in reality we have a string here which uh, one can actually model and see what is happening in the general case or when you have n batteries. So what's the implication again? Below FC the value of RDSON is irrelevant, above FC the value of C is irrelevant and 
to properly utilize uh, the RDSR, you'd like to work in this area. So let's take an example. Suppose we have an initial, between two batteries, we have an initial uh, delta V of 200 millivolt. Suppose we want a initial current of 200 milliamp, and suppose we'd like to work at uh, a frequency of 50 kilohertz. So the equivalent resistance that we need is delta V over I, which is one ohm. Now since RE is four times the resistance, and here we have two RDSON in the case of the balancing circuit insurance, so two RDSON are a quarter of uh, one ohm, which is 0.25, so therefore we need each transistor to have a resistance of 125 milliohms. Now, if I'll take the switching frequency to be, say, two times the breaking point, to be a little bit uh, to the right, then I find that the FC has to be 25 kilohertz, and since FC 1 over 8 RC, I find that I need a capacitor of 20 microfarad. So, for these conditions or these requirements of 200 millivolt initial voltage, 200 milliamp current, initial current, and switching frequency of 50 kilohertz, we need RDSON 125 and a 20 microfarad capacitor. Now, if I'll make the, cap the resistor much, much smaller, keeping the same operating condition, I'm not going to gain anything. So let's see how long would it take to balance. In a specific case, I'm just taking a numerical example. I'm assuming here, again, two batteries, and that each battery has a 10 amp hour capacity. So the equivalent capacitance of each battery is 10 times 3,600, this is this two seconds. So this is the equivalent capacitance representing one battery. And since they are in series, then we have half of it for the total. RE is one ohm. Uh, this is the time constant. So the time constant of this process is uh, five hours, which is not too bad because again, if this process goes on, then eventually it'll um, stabilize or balance out. And then the differences again, uh, will not be that large during uh, operation. Now, what about efficiency? This is something that we have to worry about. This is very simple to derive once we have the average model here, because here we see that the same current is passing through this R sub E and the output battery. So if the efficiency is P out over P in, same current is passing here, the output power is V2 over this current. The input power is voltage of B1 times the uh, same current. So we see that the efficiency is V2 over V1, assuming of course that V1 is higher than V2. And since we are talking about small differences, then efficiency could be very high. For example, if we look at the initial loss at the beginning, because it's even going down as the difference of delta V is becoming smaller and smaller. So let's see at the loss at the very beginning of the process. And in the example I've given of 0.2 volts difference and say three and a half volt battery, it's only 6%. So the loss here is indeed small as compared to the power or the energy that goes from one battery to the other. So this brings me to the end of this presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found it interesting and perhaps it will be useful to you in the future. Thank you very much.